Morning, Debbie. Morning, everyone. We're going to be in Mark chapter 11. I'm going to read 24, and then we're going to jump all the way back to 12. And I'm not even going to read all of 24, so it's interesting. We'll be talking about a tree, fig tree, money table changers, and a mountain. 24 says, For this reason I'm telling you, Okay, well, he done messed me up. So now i got to find out for what reason he's telling me what he's about to tell me. So now I've got to go back and keep going back until I finally get the story that he is telling and the combination of the story that he's saying. But keep this in mind as we're digging into the fig tree. We're going to be talking about prayer life a lot over the next year. It's where God's telling us to go. So 24 says, for this reason I'm telling you. Remember, we're going to talk about the money changers and the fig tree because that's the reason that he's telling this story. Whatever things you ask for in prayer in accordance, and i got to amplify, in accordance with God's will, believe with confident trust that you have received them and they'll be given to you. And there's so much there, but we got to go back for the reason why he's telling them this. So we're going to start with the fig tree. The scenario is Jesus is in the... Well, coming into town, he sees a fig tree. We're going to find out what happened. Then he goes into the temple, and the temple's not doing what they're supposed to. They turn, turn the temple into a den of thieves, and he says it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And then he goes, for this reason, I'm going to tell you how you should pray. So we got to go all the way back to the beginning to understand everything. So here's a tree. Verse 12. On the next day when they, they had a, left Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if it, if he found, he would find anything on it. But he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. All right, let's stop there before we get to the next one. Jesus saw a leafed fig tree in the distance. And we're going to find out in the next verse something that makes is a little interesting. Verse 14. Or, or verse 13. Where am I going? Yeah, 13. I didn't read it all. But he found nothing but leaves, for it was not in season for the figs. So here's this fig tree. It's got leaves on it. So you shouldn't be expecting anything to eat on it. <laughs> but an interesting fact. The fig trees over there, when they had leaves, they're supposed to have buds also. And the buds are edible. So Jesus wasn't expecting fruit of figs. Jesus was expecting the buds. I don't know how much nutrition you get out of eating flower buds, but that's what he was expecting on this tree. And it would be very important in a minute. So verse 14. He said to it, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening to what he said. All right. Let's go back to the fig tree. Remember, Passover's coming. That's why Jesus was going. And Passover comes in March or April. So that's important time. Now here's the fig tree. Fig season's not until May or June. So this tree is not supposed to be producing figs for several months from now, but Jesus cursed it because it's not producing fruit. Keep following the thread. Fig trees generally produce a number of buds in March. It's supposed to have its buds on it, which is the fruit. The beginning of fruit. Any, you know, like most of our vegetables, if we don't have the flower to bud, you don't get the fruit. So this thing is supposed to be having flowered buds on it that's showing you how many figs that you potentially are going to get in May or June. Then it produces the leaves in April. Which is totally contrary to most of our gardening. Most of our gardening in, in the English world, we get leaves, then we get buds, then we get fruit. But this tree produced the buds, then the leaves, then the fruit. So if we don't understand that or dig that out into culture, we're totally confused. So this thing is supposed to have a bunch of buds on it because the leaves were there. 
Leaves come after buds. So, and then it goes on, and it says, a ripe fruit would be later on in the, in the May or June. Jesus was looking for the edible buds, the lack of which indicated that the tree would be fruitless that year. Oh, 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 Jesus is telling us something from the tradition of the fig tree now, isn't it? Now it makes sense with prayer. So let's look at this tree before we even get to the money changers in connection to prayer. The tree is our prayers, it is what we're asking to be done for or to be changed or to have a situation. So if, I don't want to look at it, but remember the story of the, the farmer where, where the guy comes around and says, cut that tree down, it's useless. Remember this story. The farmer goes, no, 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 wait, wait. Let, let me remove the dirt from the fruit. Let me take care of it for a year. Let me fertilize it. Let me, get, let me see if I can make it produce again. So keep that story in your mind. So with the fig tree in relations to prayer, if first of all, if we're not praying regularly and fervently, we'll never have any buds. They could produce fruit. If we're not praying for something to happen, the fruit will never happen, right? Right. If we're not praying the situations will change, they'll never change. So He's giving us a powerful example of the fig tree in our prayer life that I was like, I've never seen this before. This is so fascinating because as I was reading 24, I was like, the temple and the house of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer, ties in with the fig tree. There's a connection and there's a powerful connection. So when we pray, we're supposed to be producing fruit, right? So we know what God's will is, so we're praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and change situations in people's lives and ask for miracles to happen that we know God wants to happen. So that's the bud that's supposed to be on the fig tree. That's the bud that's supposed to be on our prayers. Through the season, through the time, through the place and it's supposed to be, it starts to produce the leaves, which takes helps takes care of it, which produces the fruit in due season. But if we don't pray... We are a budless fig tree. If we neglect our prayer time, we are a budless fig tree. If we don't do like the farmer does and get in there and nurture that tree in the season in winter, we've got to go in and, and we got to, maybe we got to prune some branches that are going to affect it wrong. Maybe we got to go in and, and fertilize and, and adjust the, the, the soil around it. We've got, we've got stuff we've got to do as prayer warriors to get in there and take care of that tree. Even in the season, we see nothing happening. How many prayers do we have that we're praying for something and we see nothing? And we many people just get tired in winter of their prayer season and give up. I'm just, I'm done. I prayed for it for 10 years. I'm not praying for it anymore. I'm done praying for it. But they don't, they don't realize spring is coming. Then the tree is supposed to produce, the fig tree is supposed to produce the bud so that you can see a little glimmer of the fruit that's about to happen. Maybe they feel a little better. Maybe the stress of the situation changes. Maybe the somehow you're seeing a little glimmer that what you've been praying for, the fruit is going to happen. Maybe God is keeping you energized and you're like, I am going, I am going, I am going. And it doesn't matter, but you see a little bit of hope. God's giving you hope because you see the, the bud on the tree. And then it starts to leaf and you're like, yes, this tree is growing. I'm starting to see the, what's supposed to happen now. Everything you've promised me, God, everything I'm praying for, God, according to your will, because I know your will, I've studied your will, so I never asked for anything out of your will because I only ask what you say to ask for. I come doing what Jesus said in my prayer life. I'm only going to say what you tell me to say. I'm only going to do what I see you do. So there's a connection in our prayer life. What am I seeing God doing in this person's life? What am I seeing God wanting to do in that situation so that I can 
Only say what the Father wants to be said over Daniel, over Miss Dot, over that situation. I can say only what God wants to say over the life or that situation. Because I'm seeing what God wants to do. Because I have a clear picture of what he wants from his scripture. So the tree starts to make a little leaves and starts to get some buds. And we know it's a fascinating thing. Most of us have had some semblance of a garden when you when when you start to see there and whatever your favorite vegetable is or you you start to go in there and you see oh look at the flowers that means i'm getting whatever i'm getting those cucumbers or i'm getting that squash but every so often pests and disease get in there and they kill it or that little flower didn't get pollinated enough and it, you, you start to see a little baby cucumber or squash or your favorite vegetable and all of a sudden it just withers up and dies well, if I'm that farmer that asked Jesus to let me take care of this tree so that I don't have to cut it down, <laughs> my prayer life should be praying over the situation because there's pests that's going to come into our life. There's disease that's trying to come in our life because the devil's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. So even though we have the buds, we still have to be praying over the situation, protect it, help keep it safe, keep the enemy away. Oh, I'm starting to see a little turmoil over here. Let's, let's pray against that to keep this fruit tree healthy we've got to pray for the health once we start wondering what god wants for the situation the ultimate fruit we got to pray for the health of the plant so what is what is not healthy in a situation what are the things that we have to believe well i'm praying for this to happen in so-and-so's life but if they continue doing that there's no way god's going to bless them so i've got to prune this out in prayers and say lord i don't know how you're going to do it but this is a situation that i see as a good gardener a prayer warrior i see in such and such life or such and such situation this has to be removed because this is contrary to what you desire in that life or situation so let's prune that in our prayers and keep praying god you need to remove that and watch him change situations let's let's prune this because if we allow that to grow it's just going to shade out and it's going to hinder the other prayer and we got to keep going but that tree that's dying that the farmer is asking to take care of we've got to be able we got to keep throwing fertilizer on 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 even our healthy plants so every so often we need to give them a little shot of fertilizer you know a little shot of miracle grow let's give them a little shot of miracle let's put let's saturate them with soluble prayers over and over and over hey amen you know i'm praying for this it looks like you're getting healthy it looks like your finances are changing your marriage is changing but we've got to continue to keep fertilizing it with our prayers until that fruit happens and that bliss that change situation they come to you and say that's exactly what i've been asking for thank you for praying for this we continue to saturate and pray over that so it's a fascinating thing and it, and it, and it starts to happen so we fertilized it we've pruned it and we've taken care of it we we we, we saturate it with pesticides our spiritual prayers no devil can't you, you have no right to be touching them. You need to remove. Lord, is there anything specific I need to be praying over this as a demonic attack or, or just situations in life that i got to pray against? And we constantly being good little gardeners, prayer warriors, and constantly saturating with the fertilizer and the pesticides and the insecticides. we also got to protect it from, from the natural animals that love to destroy it. I mean, if we're in a deer-infested area, we've got to put deer fence up to keep the deers from coming in. Or... We've got to plant specific plants that deter deer. Well, hello. Well, there are specific prayers we need to be praying to deter the enemy from attacking our trees, our vegetables, our plants, our friends, our families, our situations, our church. There are specific prayers we've got to plant that will deter him. It says you can't attack because the hand of God is on this situation. Or we see that, you know, that's got to be gone. We've, we've got to do something to get rid of this steal kill and destroy situation over here and so we're constantly watching it but also i have to be so intimate with that tree that i know every inch of that tree i know where it's susceptible to that disease here because every year i gotta i gotta put a little bit of ointment on that right there because that seems to be where where the, this happens and, and in this part a little down here i've got to make sure I, this tree this tree right here i got to fertilize a lot more because it's just for whatever reason it's just not getting enough that tree i can almost leave alone and i, I can just go bless daniel and i know daniel's going to be good and that's all i got to do but harold over there boy i got to really lay it into him and say lord you really i need to saturate him with fertilizer and keep fertilizing and keep fertilizing 
keep praying, keep praying, and keep praying. And He produces fruit because of that. And we've got to know our trees, our fig trees intimately so that we know how to pray for them. We know at certain season, maybe around Christmas, that it's a little depressing because of this. We know around birthdays times and such and such as this. We know at certain situations and seasons, something happened in, in September in this person's life and we just saturate them with a little more prayer love because that helps them get through. But we know them intimately. We don't have to go waiting, waiting for Rhoda to, to, to say, hey, I need you to pray for this. I, we, we have enough interaction together. We know we pray because we see it happening. It's like, th this tree is just like, there's, the leaves are a little yellow, the leaves are a little curled, it must need more water. So I saturate it with prayer and give it, give it the nutrients and the water that it needs. We're having a dry season, so we've really got to saturate it with water. Or it's been a rainy season. Lord, just help them get through. And whatever that means, whatever that prayer sees, means. And it was fascinating because it all goes back to the mountain that he talks about later on. That we're supposed to be asking his will. And we're supposed to be praying according to his will. But we're supposed to be play, praying with confident trust that, he, that we received it and he will do it. So we go back to the tree. Why did Jesus curse that tree? Because that tree had no sign of fruit that it was going to produce that year. It was going to be a fruitless tree. That tree was not going to accomplish what it was designed to accomplish that year because it had no buds. Without no buds, it's going to produce no fruit. How does that relate to our prayer life? If we're not praying, nothing is ever going to happen. If we don't pray, situations don't change. If we don't pray for ourselves, things don't happen and change to us. So the fig tree is an example of our prayer life. We wither up and die when we don't pray. Because the, the prayer comes back to that intimate connection with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That we stay close to Him because we have to know Him as well as we know the tree. Because I have to go to Him and say, what's your will today? Hey, Father, the Master Gardener, do you think I need to water some trees today? Well, yeah, let, let's, let's, let's pray for the health of Rhoda here. She needs to be watered and saturated. Let, let's, let's throw some nutrients on her. Let's, cut, let's put the bird netting over because she's about to bust forth in fruit and we don't want the birds to get the fruit. Let's cover her in prayer so that that fruit can go. Our prayer life is just like that tree. Jesus is telling us in due season, we will go through winter. But through winter, our prayer life has a purpose. Spring's coming. And we start to go through winter and we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and we're praying and nothing's happening. Or worst, can they say, worst case scenario, we're not praying at all and wondering why our life is miserable. Or we're not, we're not having an intimate relationship with the Father as close as we want. And we wonder why something just feels missing. And then when spring happens, we're wondering, all right, I know God's about to do something now, but we have no buds. And he's like, all winter, all you had to do was stay saturated in my presence because in spring, you'll start to see a little bit of hope. In a couple months, you know, I, it was fascinating. I never even noticed it. The daffodils are starting to poke through the ground now around here in February. So in a couple weeks or so, we'll have daffodils in the, in the very tail end of winter. And in a couple months, we'll start to see a few little flowers pop up. We'll be able to plant a few vegetable garden goodies that will get us an early spring harvest which most of the stuff we plant this time of season don't have pretty little flowers for us but pansies and little flowers we can put them out almost right now and the frost doesn't hurt them they're like yeah whatever i'm covered god's got me god created me to have my own natural antifreeze so it doesn't hurt me it's kind of like our vegetables the cabbages and the broccolis and the, and the kales it's got its own antifreeze so god's like i got you covered and i'll feed my people early the asparagus will start popping up and through the ground and going, this is the most nutrient food you can eat because it goes so far down in the ground. Its roots are so far in the ground, 10 or 15 feet in the ground. It's pulling up minerals and, 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 and vitamins and nutrients further down in the ground than any vegetable we plant. And it's the first thing that most of the pioneers when they came over and most of the people that have it in their garden, it's the most 
he's, he's like, you've been in winter all year, and you've been eating your preserves, so it's lost a lot of its nutrition, but it's got you, it's got you through the winter. I'm going to give you something so powerful to supercharge your body so that you are ready again. That's what prayer is. It's like asparagus, and the roots should be so deep that we're bidding pulled up the most nutrient and the best of the best. But he's, he says, for this reason I'm telling you about the mountain. For this reason I'm telling you, ask what you want. But then, he's got another event. He goes into 15. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple grounds. And he began driving out with force the people who were selling and buying animals for sacrifice in the temple area. And overturned the tables of the money changers who made a profit exchanging foreign money for temple coinage and the seats of those who were selling doves. In verse 16 he said, And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise or household wares through the temple grounds using the temple area irre irreverently as a shortcut. I get the shortcut. If we stopped right there, I get you, Jesus. Use it. We, we shouldn't be shortcutting the temple. We, sh we shouldn't be using it as a pass-through. It's not a bypass to get from one side of town to the other without having to go all the way around. This shouldn't be a bypass. This is a reverent place. This is a holy place. But why was he mad at the money changers? They're doing what they're supposed to be, supposedly. They're supposed to be there for the foreigners coming. Well, I've got to have whatever. Uh, I've got Egyptian money. I need to turn it into Israeli money so that I can buy the dove or buy the animals so that I can do sacrifice. And then, since I traveled so far away, obviously my animal would get blemished, so I'm going to buy one when I get there because I have the money and the means to do it. So Jesus is mad at them. But supposedly they were doing what they're supposed to. They were doing what they're supposed to for a profit. And there's uh, nothing wrong inherently with, with making a profit. But they were making a profit in, in in we can we can argue about whether it was dishonest or unethical. I'm not gonna go there because I wasn't there. Right. But in a way that uh, if if you look back at Eli's two sons mm -hmm. And what they were doing uh -huh. with the tabernacle wasn't the temple yet. Right. Was was discouraging yeah. to the people who were were faithfully bringing their offering. Right. They were doing that that ministry that was their ministry, not their you know not not something they were supposed to do recreationally, not something they were supposed to do for for their own benefit they were doing that ministry to the people for God right and they were doing that in a way that was discouraging to the people that were bringing their gifts and I, I I can't help but think that if you get into this whole changing the coins and then buying the animal and I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they were buying the animal for a price that, that they never would have paid for it back home um, mm -hmm. that that these guys were had, had a similar spirit mm -hmm. to Hophni and, and Phineas with what they were doing. Right. Tr tradition, tradition has two explanations why Jesus was very upset. The first one, they were gouging the people. They were charging them twenty dollars for a gallon of milk. Nice milk. Even though milk was five dollars a gallon. Oh my gosh, we can hardly believe that now. You know, twenty dollars for a loaf of bread, even though a loaf of bread is even five dollars now. They're charging them twenty dollars for a gallon of gas, which we almost got there, kind of, <laughs> when it was six and seven dollars. Yeah, you know. So they were dishonest in their rate of exchange. They were taking advantage of the people. They knew Daniel traveled two hundred miles, and he needed an animal to sacrifice. What are you gonna do, buddy? Go somewhere else and buy you an animal. Mine's twenty bucks. Go find someone that's going to sell it for five this time of year. Go find someone that even has an animal to sell because this is Passover. There's thousands or hundreds of thousands or whatever the number is going to be coming to this place to buy animals. And I've only got one, Daniel. This is the last one. You may be the last one to be able to give your sacrifice. They were taking advantage of the people. The second thing I think is even worse. There's tradition that they were, enti they were entwined with the priests. 
They were so entwined with the priests, they only needed two sets of animals or three sets of animals because what they were, they were so dishonest that they would sell the dove, because that's all Daniel could afford. They sell the dove to Daniel. Daniel would take it to the priest. The priest would turn around and bring it right back to them and say that he sacrificed it. That's horrible. Understand, Jesus is pretty upset right now. And those are the two traditional things that, he, that we have from tradition that says that's why. But it was deeper than that. Those are two natural things that would really tick you off as, as, as a... A, a person in charge of a system. You're dishonest. And then you're gouging. And you've rigged the system. So I only need three or four sets of doves. I just sell Daniel dove. He brings me the same dove back. And I'm like, that dove looks just like the one you gave to Daniel. All doves look like you. Right up. You know. <laughs> so, so here's Jesus. These are two of the things he's ticked off. But that's not the main reason Jesus is ticked off. We're about to find out. This is the main reason he's ticked off. Let's see. Verse 17. He began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you've made it a robber's den? Which goes back to either interpretation, really. Yeah. See, I'm mad because you're taking advantage of the people, but I'm also mad this is supposed to be a house of prayer. And if I'm remembering right, this is the only place the Gentiles could go. They couldn't go any further, right? The outer, I'm assuming this is probably in the outer court. Mm -hmm. That's the only place the Gentiles could go to meet with, with the Israeli God or the, the nation of Israel's God, the true God that we know. This is the only place that Gentiles, at that time, we could go until Jesus come and changed the system and showed us the truth of the system. So Jesus is like, you're not even, you're not even a allowing the Gentiles to come and speak with the Father. You're not allowing the Gentiles to come and pray to the Father. You're not giving up. You're turned it into a den of thieves. You're not allowing the people that want to come pray to the Father the opportunity to pray to the Father because there's so much chaos happening in here and you're thieves. The temple. For this reason, I'm going to say that you can ask whatever you want. According to God's will, if you truly believe it, you can have it. There is a system God set up for us to go to him boldly to his throne of grace and ask his will. But a lot of things are changing and a lot of systems are changing and it's like, Hey, my TV show says, if you give me $1,000 today, I'll go to God and he'll send you a $10,000 check within a week. That's, we've turned it into a den of thieves. Hey, if you start going to church, God will bless you and it'll be all puppy dogs and roses from here on out. And all your problems will be taken care of. Well, that doesn't equate when, when, when Jesus says, we will go through stuff. We don't have to stay in the stuff, but we got to go through stuff. We got to go through winter. And we got to pray over ourselves. You've turned into a den of thieves. The only time you come talk to me and the Father is when you want something. You never, you never, come, to the, you never come to my throne and praise me and just say, Hey, Jesus, I just want to talk to you today. I'm not going to ask you for nothing. I might praise you because I think that's the right thing to do when I come talk to you. But when's the last time you go, how's your day going, Jesus? Blow your mind. The God of the Father has emotions just like us. Do we talk to him just like we talk to each other? I don't. Most of the time, I try to remember to do that once in a while. And most of the time when you go in, it's got the ABCs, Ds, E, F, Jesus, what I want. Or I go, A, B, D, that's, thank you for doing that. And it's like, I want to read. I want to read your word just to get close to you, Lord. And maybe you'll inspire me to talk to you as I'm reading. Thank you, Lord. That's pretty cool. Now, I'd never seen the connection between a fig tree, a money changer's table, and whatever. That is a fascinating thing, Lord. Thank you. 
And I just thank him. So at times in our prayer life, we're just like the money changers. We try to rig the system. Well, let me find out the perfect way to pray. I mean, there's Daniel, there's probably an, a one, two, three. And if I learn your one, two, three, because you're getting a lot of prayers answered, if I learn your one, two, three, that means my life, prayer life will be rosy. So I'm like, instead of going to the Father and having an interaction with the Father, I'm going to Daniel and going, Daniel said, first, stand on one foot in the corner and put my head in the corner. And he said, second, go say, I love you, Jesus. And third, he's saying, ask for anything I want. And then turn around and go, yay. And that's how. Instead of all the pressure's off, just go to the Father and talk to him like you talk to your neighbor or your best friend. Lord, you are my Lord and Savior. Father, your word says this. Your word, in your word, you did this for someone else. So you'll do it for Rhoda. Lord, you said that we are supposed to be multiplying and growing. So our church will multiply and grow. So Father, what is, what is the devil trying to do to kill, steal, and destroy in this situation that I need to be on the watchtower as an, Israel did and look for the enemy and going, we need to prune that. Oh, we need to fertilize over here. We need to do a little watering. Uh, this tree is prolific for doing everything and anything. We need, we, sometimes we need to remove a couple things from our life because we're trying to do too much. See, every tree has an optimal ability to grow this perfect fruit. Some tree, maybe it's only two or three. So you got to pull the other 20 buds off so that those two or three will grow to optimal fruit. Some tree may be able to handle 20. So you can only got to pull a few buds off. But we got to be so intimate with the Father knowing how we're praying. God, am I doing too much? Is there buds I need to be pulling off of my, off of my tree in, in spring so that I can produce that ultimate fruit at harvest time for you? And you go back to the fig tree. What do we do? Do I need to fertilize or do I need to prune? What am I watching? Is there pests getting ready to attack? Is it, is it a little hot? I need to give it some water. Do I need to put that netting over so the... the Things doesn't get to it. A den of thieves. A house of prayer. Well, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Are you a house of prayer? Do, or in some way have we turned our own body into a den of thieves? See, the world has done that because I can take care of it. If I make enough money, the money will take care of me. If I get enough this, if I get enough wealth, if I get enough that, or if I do this, if I know enough people, if I know the right people, if yada, 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 yada. And we throw all these things in there instead of just going, Lord, I want to produce fruit for you. And it may feel like winter that I have nothing going on for me. Lord, help me in winter to prepare for spring so that I can produce. I just, you know, Lord, I want to produce as many buds as you need to use. But if this year it's only one, that I take care of it and I nurture it like if it was my baby child so that it can produce the best fruit that it's supposed to. I may only get one cucumber this year, but boy, am I going to take care of that little cucumber. And it's going to be the best tasting cucumber. It's going to produce the best cucumber. Or maybe my apple tree only going to get one. Yeah, I'm going to get one apple this year. It's going to be the best apple I've ever had. Who's your fig tree? And remember, you're a temple. Remember, you are priests. <laughs> you are priests. So make sure you're not the little rascal is getting the stuff from the money changer and bringing it back to him in a 15 minutes, half hour when they turn around and go, okay, those people obviously did whatever they're doing in the house of prayer. So I, I've, they, they assume I've slaughtered this little dove somewhere and now I can come back here, here sell it again. And we, we've got, my cut's good, right? Yeah, we're still on a cut. Yeah, okay. You know, so I, make sure you're not that deceptive thief.
It's a fascinating thing he's got going on there. He said, The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began searching for a way to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, since the entire crowd was struck with astonishment at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples would leave the city. In the morning, as they were passing by, the disciples saw that the fig tree had withered away from the roots up. And remembering, Jesus said to him, Rabbi, Master, look! The fig tree that which you cursed has withered. I do that in my prayer life, don't I? I've, I've, you've asked me to pray for this, but Lord, I, I, He actually did it. But verse twenty-four. For this reason I'm telling you about the fig tree and the money changer. Whatever things you ask for in prayer in accordance with the will of God, believe in confident trust that you have received them. Why am I astonished that it actually happened? Because I'm praying according to His will. I'm praying what I know He wants me to pray for. I'm expecting it to happen. I shouldn't be astonished when it happens. I should be excited and happy that it happened, yes. But just flat out, I can't believe it! I should be a matured prayer warrior to when I go to prayer, it's going to happen because I know God's will. And I know whether I'm in winter and I got to keep saturating, I got to keep fertilizing, and I got to be strong enough to go through winter because winter may not be three or four months like we get. Winter could be years in the situation that you're praying for. But you know for a fact that God asked you to pray for that situation. You know for a fact, by reading his word, being intimate with him, what his will is in that situation. And you go, finally, I'm starting to see the buds. All right, Lord, my prayer has to change now because now we're in spring. I need to be protecting now. I'm starting to see you change the situation. My prayers change now. And now I'm starting to see the leaves and it's starting to grow and it's starting to flourish. Whether it's a person you're praying for to come to Christ or be closer to God, you're starting to see that fruit start to happen in their life and you start to see it moving. Confidence, trust, you receive them and they will be given to you. But the rabbis were mad. The religious people were mad. How dare you ha how dare you ask God for that? And you know my pet be that we just generically go thy will be done in a bad way because there are situations where it could be used properly. I just I don't use it ever, but there I'll give you that there's good times. But the farmer that's watering his fig tree, if you're going to die a tree, it's God's will. Sorry, I mean, I'm just I'm just here. You know, I'm watering all the trees alike. I'm giving all the trees the same fertilizer. But because you're special, sorry about your luck. If you're obviously meant to die, because all the other trees are getting the same thing. I'm saying my ABCs just like I do everything. But this situation, sorry, you must. I'm talking about the situation when you use thy will as a cop out. Because whether maybe you don't understand what God's will is. So I understand it. Lord, thy will be done, because I don't understand what, what it is. But he don't want us to stay in winter and never understand what his situation is in that. Because if he's given you the heart to pray over that situation, you need to be prepared for the spring when it starts to bud so you know how to pray differently. You need to know how to pray in the winter so that you can pray for or against certain situations that's happening in that situation. But if you just kind of throw the thy will blanket over it, you're just like, eh. Obviously, the devil can do what he wants. Obviously, God can do what he wants, so thy will be done. Well, then if that's the case, why don't we all just say, hey, Lord, eh. See, these little things, I know God's will. I pray God's will. And there's always going to be an area that I do not know God's will. There's going to be new situations happen. There's going to be new circumstances introduced to the prayers that we were praying for that we can't keep praying the same thing over and over and over again. And see, there's times where I've been praying and I, and I, I'm, I know the outcome that God wants and I'm praying and, and God will go, uh, it's time to change your strategy. You've been saying this for the last six months. You've been saying the same thing like a robot over and over and over. 
This is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's time. Hey, did you ever think about adding this or, or, or not praying that way anymore and pray this way? Because now you have new information because you've read this in Scripture. Why don't we, why don't we change our strategy a little bit and start asking me to do this first? Because obviously the bigger picture is if we can start having them make steps, then let's play this little step first so they can make a baby step so they get a little bit closer to me. And our strategy needs to change. Because remember, every tree doesn't need the same or the same amount of fertilizer. Every situation doesn't need a blanket prayer. Every tree, every situation is its own individual situation. And it, if it's growing, it's changing. But if it's dying, it's also changing, isn't it? So no matter whether, whether, the, whether it looks like the enemy is winning and it's dying and the situation's looking worse or whether the, the situation's looking better, we have to change our strategy as good watchmen on the watchtower and say, okay, Lord, I'm seeing progress or I'm seeing decline Show me the different prayer that I need to be praying because maybe I need to be saturating and, and, and telling the enemy to stay away or this needs to be changed because there's demonic attack happening or, or there's more influences happening and I've got to cover four or five different areas in this person's life because they've got, oh, they've got a lot, a lot of deadness on their tree that i got to prune off. But this person over here got a chronic going on. So I can take a little reprieve because Daniel's got it going on. I can just say, Lord, you know, bless him. And, 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 and I'm... I'm not doing a thy will on him, but I'm saying, Lord, bless him because I know you want to bless him. And God's, I'm, I'm listening. And I'm like, okay, I can move on. And I can, I can go to Harold because Harold needs more fertilizer. Harold needs more saturation. Harold needs more this. And I continue to pray over that. But there may be times where it's like, let's give a little more fertilizer to Daniel and the Holy Spirit changes my prayers and it's changing that. Or this situation is going awesome the buds are good the leaves are coming on the fruit's starting to grow and all of a sudden a disease comes into town and tries to kill the tree and we got to go oh i got to saturate it with the the pesticides and the disease sprays and i really got to cover the church or the situation or the town or the nation am i going behind the religious circles and just playing a religious scream and going around in circles. Someone told me to pray. I don't know what to pray. So I'll just, I've heard Daniel say this, so I'll just keep saying what I heard Daniel say. And we just keep going in a religious circle. I know I'm supposed to pray. I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. I read my Bible every day, but I don't get nothing out of it. But I've read my three chapters. And we just read. What if God tells you to read one? What if God tells you to read about the fig tree? And he's going to speak to you about a fig tree for a week. That we've read a hundred thousand times and we're like, well, this is stupid. That tree wasn't even supposed to have fruit. Why are you mad at that tree, Jesus? Well, if you study it and read the other two baby stories that go together, now you start to see the picture why Jesus was ticked off. It was a progression. I'm going to use the tree to set up the money changers to show you what prayer is supposed to look like. Well, if that's the case, what trees are we supposed to be really pruning to almost death? What, what, what things in situations, prayers life, that we're supposed to be saying, no more devil, that's got to go. What situations in the nation should we pray? That needs to be removed. And we're going to pray against that until that demonic force is gone. Or we just, you know, bless America. Bless our church. That's a religious thing. I said, bless them. And I thought about them when I prayed a little bit, Lord, but I didn't ask you how you wanted it done. Or I start reading some of the Old Testament and seeing some of the you know, some of the, the ups and downs of the old nation of Israel. And I'm like, man, that's our country, Lord. You help us. We, we've got to stop the downward movement. And it says when you when people started crying out to you that you, you started delivering them. So I, if I'm the only one crying, I don't want to be like Elijah. I know there's other people out there crying. Help us. And remembering Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. Verse 22. 
Jesus replied, Have faith in God, and the Amplified says constantly. Have faith in God. God's going to do what He says, and what He says is going to happen. That's why, that's why scriptures are so powerful in our hands. God's going to do what He says. He's going to do what He says. And what He says is going to happen. But if I don't know what He says, I don't know what He's going to do. So therefore, nothing's going to happen except we're going to go backwards because the enemy's going, God, Ivan, he ain't learned that one yet. He ain't bold when he goes to the throne of grace. Goes, God, would you, would you kind of maybe help me kind of sort of I don't want I don't want to be a bother you know and it's I, I just feel weak you know I, I, don't, I don't feel like I should be asking the, the creator of the universe and you're doing a really good job of buttering him up but you're not asking him nothing he's going but I have no idea what you just said you said a lot of words you beat your chest and look at me but that's a religious circle but you never asked me for anything you never give me the opportunity to either bless you because you ask correctly or to go, Ivan, um, let's go back to the book of Mark and dig into that a little more and see if that's really what I said. Okay, Jesus, show me more. Because I want to be the best prepared watchman on the tower that I can be. And if I don't know the new colors of the enemy coming, you know, okay now. The enemy's changed his colors. It used to be blue and yellow, and now it's, now it's blue and white. So if you see blue and white coming, that's going to be the enemy. That's their new colors of the gang that's coming to take us out. So make sure we're locking the gate till they get here in case there's something fishy going on. So I need more information. I need to, I know, I need to pray in a different way. God's laying someone on my heart. I mean, you go to him. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Everything's great. Is that, is, that, is that what the religious circle is telling me? God, am I just supposed to release it and say, okay, we'll stay in a religious circle, or am I supposed to go, are you sure you're okay? God's been laying you on my heart really heavily lately, and I, I just feel that I'm supposed to be praying for you. Is there anything? And then if God's really serious and he really wants to do it in his life, and if we're really open to him, he may just go, I need you to ask him this. I may need you to say jelly bean to him. And then they're going to break down. And then you, now you can be in agreement together. Yeah, I really do need some help here in this area of my life instead of going, I'm all good. We've all done it. How you doing? I'm good. And inside you're in the dark corner somewhere crying your eyes out because the situation is bad. But I ain't letting you know that. And we've also been on the other end. How many times have we went up this? How you doing? All good. But we see your situation. We know your situation. It ain't all good. How can I pray for you? I just ask God bless me. How do you want him to bless you? You know, I don't know much, but Scripture is pretty clear. Ask specific stuff. And let him decide whether you've asked right or wrong. And he'll tell you. I need transportation. Well, if I go asking for a blue, purple Lamborghini or a Tesla, God may say, no, Ivan, we, we don't need to be praying out over that person's life because they can't, they can't take care of this right now. Let's, let, let, maybe, maybe we get them a little beater. It's going to last them three or four months, but we get them a little beater so that we can, they, they get back and forth to work just to get their self situation scared away. And then in three or four months, I'm going to bless them with something a little more reliable. But I need to be asking God. Sometimes i got to ask God what he wants me to pray about. Well, that's what happens in the previous chapter where the blind guy is is asking, and he's mm -hmm. asking loudly, and he's mm -hmm. asking very insistently, and, and, and the crowd is discouraging him. Yeah, Why? exactly. Um, once Jesus turns around and, and says, well, call him, then, then they're like, sure up, on your feet, he's gone. Oh, their, their discouragement of, of someone else is, is pretty fickle. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Once they see that, that God's ready to bless you, yeah. uh, they'll change their tune. Yeah. 
but that discouragement, you know, if you if you if you if you just shut up, yeah, would well, never help. Uh, imagine if he had just shut up, well, and he would have blind. gone on his way, and then we would have had the crucifixion, resurrection. He wouldn't have been back that yeah. way. And the guy would have died blind. Yeah. So is that is that the story where he threw his cloak down too? Because there's one where he threw his, he threw his yes. cloak down. So that, cloak that, aside, he jumped to his yep. feet. So that's very important because that cloak that he was wearing was basically his sign, I'm blind. So that cloak was telling everybody when to ride, uh, this guy's blind, so maybe I'll give him a little bit, maybe I'll give him a little food. So he was still blind when he threw that cloak down until he came to Jesus and Jesus healed him. But that dude had faith first to call out to Jesus and faith that... Jesus hears me. I'm going to get healed. So I'm leaving my past behind me. I'm leaving that situation there. It, it, it's 22. So I'm just going to read the rest of this and, and, and think through it. Study it out. Because verse 24 has everything to do with the money changers and the fig tree. So I'm going to read all the way to verse 26. 23 says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whoever says to this mountain, the fig tree, the debt, the situation in your church, the situation in your, your life. Whoever says to that mountain, be lifted up and thrown in the sea and does not doubt in his heart. Very important. Amplified says, in God's unlimited power, but believes that what he says is going to take place scares a lot of religious people. How dare me be able to say what's going to happen in my life? Power and life and death ain't my tongue because obviously I don't know how to speak. That's what God's saying here. Believes that whatever he said is going to take place, it will be done for him according with the will of God. I know God's will, so what I'm speaking is what he wants because I'm saying what the Father says. It's powerful how Jesus said it. I'm saying what the Father says. I'm doing what I see the Father do. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever things you ask for in prayer in accordance with God's will, believe in confident trust that you have received them and they will be given to you. When you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, he goes into that and says, make sure you go to him and say, uh... I got a little bit against you. Forgive me. Because then God can't forgive you. And then if you want a big hindrance that's going to keep your prayers from answering, that's going to be one of them. God goes, uh, if you want me not to do what you want, have some unforgiveness in your life and we'll make sure that we put a little, put a little roadblock in that we got to work on. Next week, dig into Matthew 7 is where we're going to go. Dig into stories around it. Um, because that is exactly how we're going to tackle this prayer theme. We're going to find the prayer theme, the prayer promise, but we're going to find out the context around it. Because in religious circles, if we read that, we could take that out of context and it would scare people that have never seen God do anything in their life. Ask for anything and he'll do it. Or it's going to turn them into a fanatic and it could really mess them up. But when you study the context of it out, it gives you some meat on those bones and you really got to think about it. So see everybody. We're running late. Catch you next week.